Hey, Jeannie. Hey, G hey Jeannie, is, um, is, is your dad around? He's in the <laughs> pool, but yes. <laughs> okay. You better, I'll take you, um, I'll, I'll do it anyways. Hi, Raylan. I'll take you for a little tour and I'll show you um, our Mount Vernon next uh, associated place here. We have a we have a great picture of uh, of my wife Julia. You can just go through my house here. There we go. Okay. So there it is. Whoops. I'm sorry. I gotta get. Mm -hmm. At least I get it right. So that's uh. God, I have no directionality there. That's that's Julie, and my two boys a long time ago. Um. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, like I said, it was Southern Illinois, Hoylton, Nashville, Mount Vernon are the associated areas right there. Long time ago. So if he was around, he would appreciate it. And then up top is a view of the barn. <laughs> very cool. And these are all, all the quilts that uh, Julie's grandma made, which is very oh, true. Wow, yeah. those are nice. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We actually have here else. So this, this is like get it right here. Oh. Yeah, so when you look at uh, this one right here, see how old the whole was that video close? He can't yes. hear you. Yeah. Okay, now so, we can. <laughs> yeah, so so this quilt right here was was made in nineteen hundred. Oh wow. wow. Oh my god. Yeah, so pretty cool. That's really awesome. Cool. Yeah, quilting is a pretty lost art form. It, it's uh, my oh, grandma's nice. and their moms used to do that, and it's very intricate art form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty old school. I got let some people in here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Kate. Hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> All right, everybody. Up, oh, hey Jace. It was like ninety degrees yesterday, wasn't it, Jason? I think so. In like ninety degrees where? In Chicago, it was so bizarre. Really? I saw like yeah. Oh, it was like eighty degrees. Yeah, was, like, I know. Awesome. I saw all the pictures of like Northwestern and everything. It looked beautiful. And it's super yeah, it was cold awesome. here. <laughs> and it's pouring now, right? Yeah, no, it's back down to like nothing. <laughs> it's like zero degrees. Oh. Wow. Dr. Walsh, thank you on mute. You're on mute. Yep, thank you. Yeah, we, yeah. I was out wandering around. Yeah, it was freezing here and, and, and it was we had like torrential rains. It was it was insane. It was we had hail. <laughs> we had everything. Yeah, the hail didn't hit up in LA. It was just no. torrential downpour and it was like yeah. just gloomy and awful. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I want I want the sun to be up all the time, <laughs> especially now. Awesome. All right, glad to hear it, Jace. That's a good thing. Yeah, I got some quality studying in and I feel I'm yeah. feeling good. Uh, you'll learn a lot by doing it that way anyways, you know. You really will. Yeah, I'm glad. And we just we just um really just had a, a mid in our GE class right now doing the same drill. We had how many we had uh, fifteen breakout rooms. <laughs> oh my god! Whoa, uh, it's crazy. There were you know a lot of people didn't you know I'm going to email them. Hey, you got to try because um, cause, you know it, it, you learn and you're going to get a better score if you decide to do it on your own. You're on your own kind of thing. So. Yeah. Anyways, cool. My <laughs> test yesterday had like the whole like tr face scanning oh tracking God, yeah. stuff. No yeah. way, what the hell? It's so yeah. dumb. <laughs> That's funny. Is that supposed you know to what? work? This, you know what, if, if, uh, if that would have happened to me and I was a student, this, this is what I would have done. 
All right, so. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 How about this? <laughs> All oh right, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to take the exam. <laughs> yeah, track my pupils now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Classic. It's supposed to work. How does that technology work? The face tracking and stuff? And you know, I don't uh, even know. Yeah. I guess your eyes, if you, if you start deviating away from the, the screen, to like another screen, really? you know. Um, well, what happens if like you're just looking around like that, like you're gonna yeah, test? Yeah, that's I mean, the thing. Of course you do. You know, of course you yeah, do. Yeah, you know? that's crazy. I don't know. People freaking got to get a get a break. Mm -hmm. You know, just be flexible during these insane times. You know. Let us stand for jacket, yeah. Kevin. Oh yeah. Uh -oh. I don't know why. Oh, no. <laughs> it's just comfortable. <laughs> Shame. Shame. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how I got this jacket. Like I don't have any I don't know. It's comfortable though. I know. Take... I was very bothered by that too. You know what? I'll take it off one side. I, I had to do like a double <laughs> check. I was like, is that that, yeah, our our USC marching band does not get along with this Stanford marching band. Oh, here I got my Stanford USC marching band. Right 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 anybody? There we go. <laughs> the ultimate flip switch. <laughs> that classic. was a one eighty cap. Yeah, <laughs> classic, classic, classic. Cool. I love how even at home, Kevin's still eating during class. <laughs> oh, I'm always eating. I'm eating six times a day still. <laughs> I get I'm gonna gain like twenty pounds though. Whirling dervish has to start doing laps in the house. <laughs> wait, is that Ike? Wait, is that the Ike Harley set, Gabe? Yes, it is. <laughs> wow, oh my God. that's awesome. Nice. Ike Harley down. <laughs> what a throwback. I think Ray Lynn needs to be on Jeopardy or something. I don't know, man. <laughs> that's a throwback, Gabe. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm only here for throwbacks. He's just here to show off the green screen is what he's here for. I wonder what Classic. happened to the people in iCarly. What are they doing now? Miranda Cosgrove Miranda went to Cosgrove SC. Went oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, Miranda Cosgrove's like in school here at oh, SC. Wow. I'm not sure if she ever graduated because like she's she did like 50 million years here. I have no clue. <laughs> like Is she still in the directory? We should Good look. Question. We're all going to Zoom her. <laughs> <laughs> Miranda, we're iCarly fans. <laughs> uh, what did she, she study? The same year I did, or the year I after. I think she was cinematic arts, right? Yeah, yeah she started sense. a year after me. I feel like I read that in Tiger Beat or something. <laughs> Wait, cinematic <laughs> arts and business, or was it just cinematic or Tiger arts? Bot, whatever it was. I think it was just cinematic arts. I think she was getting a degree in like producing. Uh, I'm on technology her right now, I think. Yeah, psychology. 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 Yeah. I mean, but she started the year. She was a. She was a. When I was like my sophomore year, that's when she started at SC. Oh wow! Awesome. Well, we got a pretty good crew going on today. Not the full set. Not the full set. Oh, there's Lily, the Lily, and then uh, hey, Nemo. Wait, what was that? Who? What? Lily is in Finding Nemo right now. Oh yeah! I don't know what it's actually called, but it, the, it's the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef. That's, where, ah. that's right, where yeah. Finding Nemo takes place. But it's like the Finding Nemo version of the Great Barrier Reef. That's what it is. I was like, it's some reef. Yeah. There you go, Straya, out by uh, Gold Coast up north. Days gone by. You know, there. You know, everybody was talking about you know the um, temperature and the virus. You know, so far Australia has been, you know, since it's their summer, it hasn't been. Like this place, that's for it's sure. Getting there slowly. Yeah. I think I think Texas yeah. too. Like Texas, obviously it's very rural, so yeah. there's like a lot. But even considering like they do have some big cities and they're, you know, a very populous place. There's yeah. not very many cases in Texas at all. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it, that we shut down there. pretty early. We shut down like the same time that New York and like Los Angeles were shutting down, even though we didn't have as many cases. So I think that helped. Oh, oh are um, you in? Are you in Texas, right now, Lily? Yeah. I'm in Dallas. Yeah. Dallas. Uh, my, I saw, friends were, my friends were up to San Antonio. No. Yeah, I saw so. some really interesting stuff about California has essentially like 
obviously like we don't want to you know pat ourselves on the back yet but pretty much flatten the curve yeah la's um, getting dark yeah no yeah, they obviously like we're, we're still seeing more cases but in like mid late march the estimated peak date was like april 30th and now they re-evaluated a couple days ago and they said the estimated peak date is for california april like 15th yeah and yeah, that's it's, it's moving the other way yeah exactly and then i know that they said that um a lot of the epidemiologists in california have come out and been like hey guys this is not a, a reason to stop social distancing if anything it's yeah. to amp it up but that being said um the estimates that we had are drastic overestimates now due to the level of like you know policy and other stuff that's gone into place in the California. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the model's right. expected less compliant. <laughs> yeah. Know, so. yeah. Oh, cool. Awesome guys. All right. I guess we should go about the business of learning stuff for the final. <laughs> And uh, there is a crew here, a crew here today, also that will be staying afterwards when when we get done with the lectures. That will be doing the the uh, midterm. And we'll we'll set those people up into the breakout rooms as well, which is awesome. All right, cool, 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 cool. And then we might uh, need to. If there's still fuel, then we might need to. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how it we'll see how it works. And awesome, very cool. Maybe, maybe Lily and I will go have a breakout room. <laughs> Um, all right, cool. Well, I'm gonna. I guess I'm gonna go off the business of uh, doing the lecturing. Other than that, we, you know, everybody's obviously um, a lot of the um, grading has already been done. So if Richard's in, he was asking about the grading. So so um, the, the team is pouring through it, and uh, of course, for the most part, I don't even understand how it happened. But everybody's getting hundred. I don't know. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> I guess we're just really good teachers, you know. We all listen to what I had to say. It's really amazing. Yeah, yeah. See, doesn't that make you like, yeah, you're, you're a really good teacher. <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right, cool. All right, well, let me um, let me go about the business of sharing my screen here and get rocking. And uh, that's it. So um, just like the first midterm, um, some of it applied to the second midterm, but it is standalone and the finals can be standalone. And we'll see how far we get. You know, I, you know, I, I apologize, you know, for the second midterm that I just felt it was my absolute mission to learn as much as I could, as did everybody in this class about what was going on with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And early on, there was such little information. And I felt like I was finding it before, you know, certainly before Washington was, before USC was. And that's why I was just pushing on it to keep you guys abreast of what was going on. And, um, and so as a result, I didn't finish as much as I wanted to for midterm two, but we had it dialed in. I wanted to do stroke completely in midterm two. So, and you know, in the same case may happen for the final and you know, it is what it is, it's all good. So we'll, we'll get what You we did get. call a lot of the things that happened way before than they had. That was crazy. Absolutely, man, absolutely. You know, and it was just, just a matter of going down there, you know, this shows you, you guys can do this, man. You search around, you find good data, you find good sources, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm just as kind of an aside, you know, they, um, the, uh, you know, the cytokine, cytokine storm, it's just more and more where that's, you know, that's what's happening. People that have aggressive immune systems are the ones that um, the, the immune system is just overshooting its mark and killing off the lungs. And so, so over and over and over, um, people that are um, immune compromised, but managing it are faring much better. So, so, um, so people with Crohn's disease, people with irritable bowel, irritable bowel syndrome taking anti-inflammatory um, anti meds are doing better. Um, the, the HIV population is doing better. Um, and, you know, so they're like counterintuitive, but it's stuff like this is, is, is coming through, you know, all, over and over again. And it was, I, was, I was looking at, um, you know, another disease that hits you guys personally because you're the age group, especially when you're, you know, your cluster is packs at USC, is meningitis. And, uh, and people die in, from meningitis from, from a, not a lung cytokine storm, but just a blood-based cytokine storm where you go, you become septic, and then the immune system turns on every freaking organ in your body. And, um, and uh, so, so, again, that's a treatment for sepsis to this cytokine storm. And of the best thing you 
is get your vaccination um, for A and B in terms of meningitis. If you haven't gotten it and you're not a believer in vaccination, maybe you are now. <laughs> and you should definitely do it. So, all right, cool. All right, here's my diatribe. All right, so that's what I'm famous for. Yeah, I guess you guys are probably missing that, man. That's, that's there was idea. one post that was like, this is the world without one vaccine. And it's yeah, pretty yeah. terrifying. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Um, you know, hopefully we can get our anti-vaxxers on board. But uh, anyways, let's, let's see what I'm doing here. All righty. I'm going to share sound. There's, there's good videos today. We're going to share a screen. All right. And we're going to move on. Oh, all right. Very cool. All right. Where was I? Well, I was updating this. In fact, you know, I was, so, I was updating this so quickly that the, the one you guys have is not going to be the same as this. So when I get done today, um, so if you downloaded your, uh, your, uh, set, your vision, uh, vision, aging, and disease uh, PowerPoint, um, you can go ahead and delete that because I'm going to upload a new one after, after lecture today. <laughs> That's the way I roll. All righty. So, um, yeah, so this, this is the drill. We're going to do uh, visual system, auditory system, vestibular, and, and just spend a small amount of time on, on smell and taste. All right. So um, I think the, the one that is most important is we're going to go over um, um, uh, visual system aging and disease. And so we're going to start with um, the normal expected changes that you're going to have. Stuff like this, man, I was 20, 20 my whole life until mid 40s, and then whew, there it goes, okay? So this is a condition called presbyopia, and it's gonna be very relatable to everything you guys have learned up to this point in time about um, uh, free radical biology and, uh, and cross-linking of proteins, okay? Uh, and then we'll follow that up with uh, a discussion of uh, problems in terms of dark adaptation. Um, and dark adaptation, you know, you, you, you see that with your grandparents. Um, if you take them to a movie theater and you go into the, you know, from the lobby into the movie theater, you know, you guys take for granted how quickly your photoreceptors adapt to the low light levels. It takes, you know, two, three times as long for people of my um, tribe to do that. So, all right, cool. All right, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk now about this, uh, uh, normal expected age-related change in our vision. It's called presbyopia. And um, this is um, reduced uh, rounding up or accommodation of the lens. And um, um, it's classic farsightedness, okay? So you can still see things far away. The lens is fine for that, but it's, it's ability to round up and accommodate to close objects. And that's the problem. And so this is just a little graphic right here that uh, shows as a function of age right here, uh, the um, ability to accommodate, and that's the scale on this side, and you can just see that um, it really just goes, you know, when you get into your late 40s, it just goes whoosh, like that. Okay, awesome. Okay, all right. Um, so, so, you know, what, what is this all about? Okay, um, so this is what your lens looks like right here, located in your eye, and, um, um, I'm going to go ahead and just grab another arrow while I'm at it here. Boom. Okay. And uh, so when, when we um, look at light, okay, the lens flattens out. I'm going to talk, we're going to show, illustrate this with the normal eye when you're looking at really distant objects, objects to, to change the focal plane for distance vision. And then um, just like a magnifying lens, um, it gets really, really thick when you're looking at things that are really close. Okay. All right. So, um, what, what's going on here? So the crucial thing with all this has to do with um, this muscle group right here, right? So that we have um, uh, uh, the ciliary muscles located right here, and then they're connected to uh, these fibers called zonal fibers right here. And, um, and the, the kind of a key concept, yeah, it's a little counterintuitive, is that um, what happens is uh, we have, uh, you know, lots and lots and lots of tension um, in the fibers right here, okay, when, uh, when the muscle is relaxed, okay. So we're going to have, we're going to go ahead and walk you through that, all right. So, um, again, focusing on a nearby objects, the ciliary muscles contract, okay, and so that's right here. So now the muscles are contracting, 
And, um, and, and when that does that, the contraction of the muscles actually reduces the tension on these fibers. And so then the lens proteins are gonna do what they normally do, and they're gonna accommodate or root and circle up into a ball, okay? Awesome, cool. Down there, boom, okay. So aging, okay, what it does, causes, one thing it causes is the um, ciliary muscles to lose strength, okay? So, um, so it's just like any other muscle in your body, okay? Um, you have um, a loss of skeletal muscle fibers right in here, okay? Um, and so they're gonna lose strength. Um, the other thing that happens is uh, the lens itself, um, undergoes uh, a loss of its elasticity, all right? And this is uh, really due to the damaging effect of ultraviolet rays. So the best, the best thing you can do is have glasses that at least minimizes the, the impact of the ultraviolet rays. Um, the UV causes this oxidation process and cross-linking of the proteins. And, um, and in, in the end, worst case scenario we're gonna see um, is it is a kind of a predictor for having uh, a glaucoma as well. Okay. Awesome, cool. Alrighty, so this kind of just you know highlights this. So these um, the ciliary muscles right here. Okay, how they work. All right, so they they um, their job is when you want the, the the lens to to round up or if you want the lens to flatten up, they got to change their contractile state. All right, so um, so these. Um, suspensory ligaments, also called zonal fibers, um, are, are basically tethered you know, the uh, the lens to the um, to the muscle group, the ciliary muscle group right here. So we can see uh, again, like this, as I was talking about earlier. Okay, all right. So um, so if we want um, the the lens to relax, okay, which is what we're doing right here, okay, all right. So um, these fibers right there have to be able to relax themselves as well. And that requires a contraction of the muscle. All right. So presbyopia, like I said, is the combination. It's a problem with this um, muscle weakening and then the lens not being able to have its normal elasticity. All right. We can look at this in, in kind of 3D. The problem is we're kind of looking at 2D here and, and we can look at 3D and, and get a, a better feel for what's going on. So um, we see um, right here, okay, uh, the ciliary muscle group, and this is showing the ciliary muscle group, again, all the way around the lens right there. We see these zonal fibers or, or the suspensory ligaments, so it's one and the same, that connect uh, the muscle to the lens right there. And um, we see that here, that the, the, the muscle is relaxed, okay? And when the muscle is relaxed, then there's tons of tension on these guys and it pulls this flat and that's what happens when you go out and you look distance, okay? Alrighty, now, um, and it's, it's indicated in the verbiage right here. So then we see here that we're now going to look at something up close and the muscles contract that loosens these fibers and then the natural rebound uh, elasticity of the lens causes it to round up so you can focus on something close. Um, and this is why, you know, if you've been reading a long, long time, studying whatever you're doing and, um, and you're starting to have eye fatigue and, and you notice that, God, I'm, I'm having trouble on focusing on the book that I'm reading or something up close, then all you need to do is look across the room for about a minute or 60 seconds. And, um, and then the contractile state of the muscle goes from this to this, and you're able to, to um, reinvigorate your system in terms of lactic acid and ATP production and fatigue. And then you go right back and you'll see that you'll focus a lot better, all right? So that's, that's um, the, the, the essence of presbyopia right there. Okay. So um, we'll uh, watch a, a, a quick video on this and it goes over, this is a, a cool video, it goes over not only um, presbyopia, it goes over cataracts, it goes over um, uh, um, a, a bunch of other eye diseases that we're gonna be talking about in this class. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and jump into that and we'll watch it.
separately. First, as an object approaches, both eyes track it in a process called convergence. The size of the eyes in this example has been greatly exaggerated so that the subtle movement that takes place during convergence can be seen. Convergence of the eyes keeps the image of the object of interest centered on the fovea, the part of the retina where resolution is highest. If the eyes do not converge appropriately, diplopia, or double vision, occurs. Second, the pupil must constrict to restrict the entry of light rays diverging from a near object, since diverging rays cannot be bent enough by the periphery of the lens to make them fall on the fovea. If the pupil were to remain dilated, the image would be blurred. Finally, the shape of the lens must change, increasing its refractive index so that the light rays passing through it converge on the fovea. In distance vision, the lens is pulled at its equator by the suspensory ligament, so that it is relatively thin. When the muscles of the ciliary body contract, the tension on the suspensory ligament decreases and this allows the lens to assume a rounder shape, increasing its power to bend light. As a result, the image is focused on the fovea. Combined convergence, pupillary constriction, and rounding up of the lens all function to keep an object in focus as it approaches the eye. Awesome. <laughs> You kind of like that song too. Very cool. Alrighty. So that's how we focus in on objects. Alrighty. Um, what happens again with aging? Um, aging is um, a weakening of the muscles. Okay. So uh, if they're weak, then that means that uh, the um, the uh, cell fibers, okay, they do not. Uh, Fully relax, and then the lens can't fully round up. Okay, um, and a stiffer lens in combination with that means that you're going to have a lens that is even having more problems that is rounding up. And, and we'll, we'll see that this is due to this protein, okay, called crystalline. And bizarrely, um, the core of our lens, these proteins um, are with us from embryo and then it gets bigger through fetus and we complete we continue to grow and put layers and layers like you do on an onion um, but those long-lived proteins um, are likely to accumulate um, oxidative damage okay cool all right all right so, so this kind of illustrates a little bit of what i was talking about here okay so this is the the fetal core of the lens and this is how big it becomes um, uh, as you are a growing embryo. Then layers and layers, layers are put on as an adult. And finally, you put out these final cortical layers out here. Okay. And um, so what happens with aging okay, is uh, these lens proteins undergo, sound familiar, okay, non-enzymatic post-translational modification. Okay. Um, so one of the big non-enzymatic post-translational modifications that happens to lens proteins is, um, is the attachment of sugar and the formation of advanced glycation end products. Okay? And these advanced glycation end products that accumulate on these lens, lens proteins um, dramatically increase the absorption of uh, ultraviolet light. So there's you know, UVA, UVB, and UVC. And it's the UVA that activates them, and then that triggers oxidative dam damage of surrounding um, uh, crystal proteins, right? They become cross-linked, they become rigid, and lo and behold, you have Dr. Walsh's glasses on, okay? So it, it does connect uh, a lot of what we've been you know, talking about all throughout the class. Um, yes. For treatments for cataracts, there's the refractive lens exchange, mm -hmm. how effective is that? Because I know that uh, patients often have to choose between the um, nearsighted and farsighted versions of the lens. And I know recently they came out with that new adjustable lens. And I was right. just curious on what you think is the best um, 
options for someone with cataracts? Yeah. So, you know, it's all a matter of what you're used to, you know, so, um, so, so some people are not um, eyeglass wearers, you know, um, and so that transition of, because the traditional um, cataract surgery, and we're going to go over that at some point either today or, or on Monday, the traditional cataract surgery, you know, you, you pull out the lens and you put in this artificial lens, and that's back to what, uh, what Kevin was talking about. And, um, and, and the, the art, you know, traditionally just had really one focal plane, you know, and so, um, so you would, because most of your time you needed to drive, manipulate your environment and not read. So it would be like that. And then, and then you would put glasses on um, alternatively um, when you're uh, reading up close or you can just get a, um, you know, so I, I, you know, I have, um, I don't have bifocals. I have, um, uh, God, I'm freaking tired right now. <laughs> I have, uh, you know, kind of universal lenses that are, um, that transition. So, but yeah, it's all, it's, but, but yeah, that's, that's pretty new technology. And, um, and, um, and, and, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's really a matter of up to the patient. So, but good question. So is there any way to reverse that, that oxidative damage done to the cataract or once the cataract's there, is it pretty much there for good? Yeah, no, it's done. It's done because it's so deep and, you know, in so, in under so many layers of proteins, you know, so it's kind of a, it's a done deal, sadly, you know, so it's not like mm -hmm. a surface protein where you could kind of reverse oxidation by, by taking in antioxidants and things like that. So it, it, no, it's truly a done deal. So yeah, so I, my, my brain was thinking, yes, these things are, are called progressive lenses and that's, that's what I have. And so that, that is an option to have on top of, um, that type of lens, uh, uh, a unifocal lens, Kevin. So cool. Cool, cool. All righty. So, um, all righty. And as I indicated, we're, we're going to revisit this because so because everything that we're talking here that is just normal aging, um, um, it is, you know, the the, um, the advanced caucasian end product chromophore, the oxidation just happens in overdrive um, when you have cataracts. And um, so, uh, so we definitely will be revisiting this. Okay, cool. All right, so this is, uh, again, just showing uh, what, you know, what I was talking about before. So this is early embryos. This is, uh, um, this is the, the, uh, the fetal nucleus of the lens. And then this is just during uh, um, different years of maturation into adulthood in the final cortical layer that is laid down. And this is a, an image that we can done of the lens. We're going to be talking about uh, this, this special type of in, imaging later on that you guys would use as ophthalmologists. And then there are, there are these different cortical layers, and you know, not here and there for this class, but studies have shown that, th that different cortical layers have different sensitivity and vulnerability to this oxidative damage process. Okay. All right. So... So um, um, again, this is looking at the changes in the, the lens over time. Um, and um, so it does get thicker and thicker. And so you're just adding layer after layer after layer here in terms of, of the protein. And so these inner proteins have the tendency to get damaged. These outer ones that are more exposed to UV light also get damaged. And so, um, this, so does, this is just... Does LASIK work by like shaving off those lasers or those layers? Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so um, what LASIK? Because um, the lens is just part of the refraction of light. The other part of the refraction is your your outer cornea and the anterior chamber. So it bends light all through there. And so when you do LASIK surgery, what you're doing is you're scarring the cornea, and then the cornea changes its shape. And then as a result, um, that will bend the lights in, in, you know, they have it worked out that, that it'll, the type of scarring that you get will bend so that now the, the image will focus on the back of your retina. So yeah, so this is the lens we're talking about now, but what you're talking about, Riaz, is the, um, is the, um, is the corneal surface. Okay, cool. thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, all right, well, um, so when we look at this graph over here on the right, we can just we can see again uh, as a as function of age down here on the um, on the uh, lower x-axis, and we can see on the y y-axis, um, you know the very core right here um, 
shows some transition, but it's the outer layers right here. Uh, so, so it'll be outer layer here and outer layer here. It seemed to be most vulnerable, and that's because of it's the most the greater likelihood of having these advanced guy patient end products impact the protein, and then having the light go through and having the reaction to cause oxidation. Okay. Awesome, very cool. All righty, and um, again, as a function of, of age, you see the ability of the lens to um, do any transitions and change. So that's that's actually kind of a lame graph, so don't worry about that. Okay. Oh, righty. So this is a a pretty nice review article that um, does an overview of what happens in terms of this oxidative damage, and as well as um, you know the the steps can be that can be taken to minimize the problem. So. So light is damaging, right? X, uh, the, um, the energy of the light, light rays, you think of X-rays, you think of UV, and so this is the ultraviolet light, okay? It's part of the electro electromagnetic spec spectrum, okay? So it's, it's causing um, um, damage to ocular tissue, all right? Um, all right, uh, next, um, the chromophore, okay? So this is a combination of lipids and proteins okay, that absorb the light rays. And I said the worst is when you put advanced glycation end product on that. Um, what then happens is um, when the chromophore absorbs that energy, um, that will kick off an electron. And now you have, we have uh, the unpaired electron that's going to start oxidizing lipids and proteins. And this is going to result in overall degradation of, uh, of the lens. All right. So the, the key uh, with this is. Yeah, you wear sunglasses, prescription glasses, and you eat antioxidants you know, throughout your life. And it, and it will protect, this from, protect the, you from having this happen. Um, if you're excited right now, it doesn't mean you're protected. Um, you will likely be both nearsighted and farsighted, okay, someday in your life. All righty. So um, again, this, this is uh, showing the different types of penetration of the ultraviolet radiation that goes through the cornea, okay, the aqueous humor, and then the lens. And you, so you see that the UA is the one that gets in there and does most of the damage to the lens, okay? The, the other um, uh, components of ultraviolet radiation for the most part get filtered out. So in comes the, the ultraviolet radiation, okay? It activates a chromophore, all right? That is then transferred um, two, and it's really just heat energy is transferred over to neighboring molecule and boom, spin off um, a superoxide uh, molecule or a hydroxyl radical and cause the damage. Okay, this is an example right here of the um, oxidative damage that might happen in a neighboring uh, protein. Okay, um, and so we have these protective filters that we see over here. Okay, um, but you, if you get through those filters and you start to damage, um, damage the, uh, the proteins with oxidative damage, you have um, um, lots and lots and lots of problems in, in the membrane tissue. Cool. All right. All right. So this is the one, okay, that is, is a little bit of review. It also goes in, I believe, in the back of the degeneration as well. All right. So let's do this drill. So, why is it that sooner or later, everybody gets presbyopia? What's going on? It's all about how your eye works and how it changes over time. When you look at the world, light goes through your cornea into your pupil, the hole in the colored part of your eye. Then it passes through the lens, which focuses the light into a point on your retina, the light sensitive lining at the back of your eye that works sort of like film in a camera. From there, the image is converted to electrical impulses, which are whisked off to your brain. A long story short, you see friends and sunsets and movies and emails and art and videos about presbyopia. 
Now, let's take another look at the lens. When you focus your eye, tiny muscles actually pull on the lens, changing its shape. When you're young, the lens is flexible, so it's easy for those muscles to focus the lens on whatever you want. But over time, the lens gets stiffer. It becomes a struggle to pull it into shape, especially for seeing up close. Light starts focusing behind your retina instead of on it. And the images sent to your brain? Blurry. By your early 40s, your lenses will lose enough elasticity that you'll probably notice when you read at a normal distance. Eventually, they'll barely flex at all. But it's normal, even if you've always had perfect vision. And that is why everybody gets presbyopia. So, if the fine print is getting hard to read, visit your optician as soon as you can. If it's presbyopia, you've got plenty of ways to deal with it. A lot of people like having both multifocal contact lenses and varifocal glasses for flexibility. Or you can try reading glasses. Your optician will know just how to help, because everybody gets it. All right. So I'm sure you guys have noticed uh, your parents. Here's the, uh, the video I was expecting. Um, um, <laughs> here you, you guys have noticed your parents um, with all their Costco specials scattered all over the house, okay? And uh, your future, um, how awesome is that? So uh, again, it, it's, um, it's a stiffness of the lens in combination with a loss of strength in the cilia muscle, okay? Awesome. All right, so let's watch this one now. Many of us have revision, at least to some degree, but what causes it? And what can we do to bring our world into better focus? Light enters the eye through the pupil, which works much like the shutter of an automatic camera to help us adjust to brighter or darker conditions. When we need more light, the pupil opens wider. When we need less light, the pupil becomes smaller. Light rays entering the eye also must be bent into a precise point of focus on the retina found in the inner back of the eye. So that when this movement of the pupil, remember that in terms of your grandma or grandpa going to a movie theater or driving at night because that requires muscular contraction and it weakens and you light that in as you get to it. If it doesn't happen, our vision is blurred. Eyeglasses and contact lenses sharpen focus by bending light and changing the way it enters the eye. But why do we have blurry vision in the first place? Well, when you're farsighted, your eyeball is too short. This means that light rays reach a point of focus beyond the retina. In this case, you see blurry images up close. But when your eyeball is too long, Light rays achieve a point of focus before they can even reach the retina. This means you are nearsighted and objects appear blurred in the distance. Oh, myopia. Wow. Many eyes also have an irregularly shaped cornea, which is the clear part of the eye's surface. When this happens, light rays can have several different points of focus. This is called astigmatism, which also causes blurry vision. If you want to know more about common causes of blurry vision and about vision correction options such as eyeglasses, contact lenses, and refractive surgery, be sure and visit the allaboutvision.com website. You also can uh, find... All right, and I'm sure you guys have astigmatisms as well. All right. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Walsh, do you know anything about yes. uh, keratoconus? What's that? Do you know anything about keratoconus? It's like a astigmatism related disease. Um, no, I actually I, I don't. I mean, I've heard of it, but I don't. I really don't know much about it. So, okay. do you know somebody that has it, Kev? Or? I have it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I actually do not. I do not. But uh, um, it's you know something that I'm gonna have to research. And I've, like I said, I've heard of it. I know. I know that. It, Irregularities in the, in the cornea, but uh, you know, why it happens? Uh, yeah, you gotta find out. Yeah. Cool, <laughs> man. You got you got some. Uh, you're a case study, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Alrighty, so this is uh, what we cover: presbyopia, and then the second um, 
big normal age of age, which means every single one of you will experience this, is that you decrease in dark adaptation. And uh, so, you know, there's, you know, a little verbiage on here, and it just, you know, in terms of, you know, everyday life, um, having to adjust to darkness isn't real. So, like I said, you go, go from, from the lobby to a movie theater, you know, it's really kind of be risky when you get older because you can't see anything. Um, and because you're not getting enough uh, light going in and activating the, uh, the retina in the back. And we're gonna, there's a multiple reasons for this happening. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the, the example they show here is for a seven-year-old to reach this level of light detectness, maybe somebody over there in their 20s, can be like a 10-minute difference, okay? And this is a, you know, a big deal when you're driving, too. And, and then you combine the, the driving problem with um, the, uh, the, the level of chromophores that are in your lens, and light scattering, and it, it's, you know, it's a big, big problem. All righty. So right here, these are different scales, okay? And they're looking at uh, different type of rod sensitivity out here, right? And then this is right at where the, um, the uh, macula is. We have this transition that goes from cones to rods. And you see that as soon as you leave the color vision area, you see this big transition that's happening here um, in terms of time it takes. This is showing the, the difference in the time it takes to achieve the same level of sensitivity here. And this is just the log scale of the measurement I'm looking at. You look at 20 to 80 years of age, and you can see that, you know, depending on the level of the index of sensitivity, it can be, you know, 10, 15. So, so that's a big deal. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Next. Okay. Um, so what are the reasons for the dark adaptation uh, problems? Okay. So, um, so I mentioned one thing was, you know, was the uh, inability to uh, fully open your, uh, your, your, uh, your pupil, which is just a, con a constriction of the muscles that regulate the size of the iris. So this right here is an illustration of the lens and what's happening in, uh, okay, and so us being people from a 64-year-old tribe, 64 in June, is, um, is you clouding this half the lens and sometimes more green you see it right in here okay and you can see it right in these are different types of uh, ways of looking at this is dark field uh, uh, micrographs and so instead of having to transmit through the lens and go back to the eyeball um, the light hits boing, goes back the other way so the light's going to hit and instead of going through it's going to go boing the other way or it's going to boing 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 like that uh, but you're just not going to, it's a filter, you're just not going to get as much light in the lens, I mean, through the lens into the retina. So that's part one, right? So two, okay, um, like I was saying, is uh, the ability to, um, to uh, open this up, okay? So you, get a, you have your pupil, all right? So your pupil nerves and your muscles contract, okay? Our muscles weaken as we get older, okay? So the ability to go through this transition right here lessens as you get older. And so, so aging reduces pupil dilation, meaning it's going to get in. This has to do with um, muscle weakness, tissue thickness. All right, next. The third change that we see is that um, in the back of the eye, okay, so this is the retinal surface back here. So we see uh, uh, the area of color vision. Okay? Um, the macula is higher sensitivity of vision. So right here, you this transition from, from cones to rods, from color to black and white. Um, and so we see right here, this is illustrated right here. All right, so this is your cone peak. You see the transition happening out, and then it becomes all um, just light detector white. The sensitivity of uh, your photoreceptors goes down dramatically with age because the number of these these cells called photoreceptors they go down. Okay, we lose brain cells when we get older. Lose this type of nervous system tissue as we get older as well. So it's going to definitely affect your visual acuity. It's going to affect your ability to detect light. All right. Um, other studies have shown. So we have. Um, it's filtering out because it's scattering. 
we have uh, reduced opening up of our pupils. And it's called uh, meiosis, okay? And um, we have a reduced number of photoreceptors. When we go and look inside the photoreceptor, we see there is um, a real slowing in the glycolytical pathway that's responsible for opening up the, the channels right here. So we have this light that activates the and you go through this G protein cascade that opens up ultimately because of opening up of the, the calcium channels, the psychic aim channels you see. That. So, you know, what do we know about protein turnover? It gets slower as we get older. So we get old proteins here that are not as effective. So this whole pathway does not work as well. Sounds fun, doesn't it? Getting older? Oh, okay. That, that is normal aging, okay? These are all expected changes that have with aging. And now we're getting into um, uh, cataracts, okay? And cataracts is uh, beyond. It causes a significant clouding of the lens to the point that you can't see anymore. And if we, you know, look at the um, age-related diseases of the eye, okay, and we look at um, by by far, sorry, the um, by far the, um, the 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 number of people that have cataracts versus glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and, and age-related macular degeneration, cataracts is the most common problem that you're gonna encounter um, in your practice. Okay, we'll be getting to this. Okay, um, uh, this right here, of course, is uh, a risk of the whole metabolic syndrome that's diabetes. Okay. All right, so um, that same view that I was showing last time right here. Again, um, these different cortical layers are more sensitive for um, the oxidation that, that uh, changes the structure of the, uh, the lens. And these are just different um, methods. This type of, of uh, uh, microscopy that you can do in the office. And you can see this trace of cloud right in through here, okay? And then these lenses and these lenses were taken post-mortem from people that died, okay, and that off their body up to science. And you can see the clear um, stratifications or evidence of the cataracts being that are developing. Okay? All right, cool. All right, so this um, uh, is the, the slide from la the images from last time. Um, this right here, this slide is really interesting in, in that it, we can see a, a major blow up what's going on here. Um, so again, the, the, the image that you take just with basic microscopy, and then we, if we hone in to these regions here, okay, and do um, high-powered electron microscopy, you can see what happened to the solar structure and, and how damaged it is. So you know, no big surprise, it's not bending light appropriately and that you're getting light scattering and going boing, boing, boing like that, okay? Cool. All righty. So we'll go ahead and watch this guy right here. Um, I think this is the one that's <laughs> that, that covers other things besides just cataracts, but it, uh, it, it gives you a feel of life to have cataracts. It um, gives you a feel of what it's like to have magnification. It gives you a feel of what it's like to have um, Title, Vision Simulations, People with Visual Impairments Using Assistive Devices. For people with normal sight, it can be difficult to fully comprehend the experience of the visually impaired. One frequent comment from those with vision loss is, you could see what I see, you'd understand what I'm going through. In this section, we have created a series of simulations for the most common causes of vision loss. We hope that by viewing them, you will gain a better appreciation for vision loss and improve your ability to assist and communicate with those who have low vision. Title, Macular degeneration a blurred image with dark spot in the center. Macular degeneration is the leading cause of vision loss among older people. It is a condition that affects the center portion of the eye. That's the part responsible for central vision and seeing detail. Title, cataracts. A sharp focused image becomes blurred. A cataract is a cloudy area that forms in the lens of the eye. 
Cataracts cause an overall blurring and haziness of vision. If you have cataracts, it often appears as if everything is out of focus. People with cataracts tend to be very sensitive to bright light and glare. Title, Glaucoma Retinitis Pigmentosa, a blurred image with a sharply focused area in the center. While very different conditions, both glaucoma and retinitis pigmentosa result in a loss of peripheral vision, often described as tunnel vision. People with a certain type of glaucoma can also experience nausea, headaches, and halos around bright lights. Title, Diabetic Retinopathy, a blurred image with dark spots throughout. When diabetes damages the tiny blood vessels in the retina, this condition results in overall blurred vision and blind spots from bleeding in the eye. The conditions can produce patchwork images where portions are completely blocked out. Title, hemianopsia, stroke-related blindness. Image of a refrigerator, left side blurred, right side focused. The result of a cerebral stroke, brain tumor, or trauma, hemianopsia, is the loss of vision in half the visual field. Look at how difficult it is to see the water and ice dispenser on the left. People with this condition can benefit from learning new techniques to scan their environment. Awesome. So that was a pretty good review of the different type conditions that we're going to be looking at in this class. And you see the difficulty that people would have um, if, if um, they were experiencing cataracts. Okay, so we... Um, in review, we have uh, talked extensively about, sorry, oops, grab this guy, about this oxidation of crystallines and a scattering of light. So, so the treatment for this is um, an ultrasound, okay, and it's called, uh, it's a special probe um, that you put directly in against the lens, and it's called fake calcification. And once you have emulsified the, the lens, you will suck it out with perforation, and then you're going to replace the lens with um, a, a silicone or a, an acrylic interocular lens. And this is what Kevin was talking about earlier. All righty. Um, all right. Oops, sorry, I didn't want that. So basically, in fact, I don't, I don't even need the uh, um, the arrow, but but uh, it, this is a radiation I was talking about. So um, you're, you're going to hit it with a, a set um, radio free calcification lens, okay? And, and then you're going to remove, you um, uh, suck it out and replace it uh, with an acrylic lens. So let's take a look at this. Um, some of you may become um, ophthalmologists, so this will be useful to you. Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Ritchie, and I want to thank you for joining us again today. This time, what I'd like to do after last month where we did the tour of the surgery center is now take you through an example of what a cataract surgery patient goes through with their cataract surgery. So we're going to follow a patient through the process today uh, and see just what's involved with cataract surgery. Yes, I know exactly. Come on in and have a seat and slip off your shoes. Bonnet on you. Beautiful, like us here. There we go. Go ahead and lay on back. So cover it up. A nice warm blanket. Fresh out of the oven, huh? Yes. Heat it up just for you. All right. Bill, which eye are we working on for you today? My right eye. Sounds good in your date of birth. And just get you hooked up to our monitors. Get a blood pressure cuff, heart monitor, and oxygen monitor on you. Okay. And when's the last time you've had anything to eat or drink? I had my meds this morning and a small glass of water. Otherwise, it was 10 o'clock last night. Okay. And did you use your eye drops since Sunday? Yes, I did. Morning. And this morning. Good. And we'll get started with the eye drops that are going to numb and dilate that eye. Okay. And remember, they sting for about 30 seconds when we put them in. Yeah. There we go. Great. Yeah. 
And when you're done today, do you want some coffee, orange yeah. juice, water, tea? Uh, that would be a T-bone steak. Or really? <laughs> steak and eggs or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You might have to take me out then. I don't know where we're going to go. <laughs> Okay. What would you like? I would like uh, decaffeinated coffee. Yeah, that does sting, and it also does get your uh, tear drops working, don't it? Yeah. I'll do another drop here. This is that cleansing drop. This is that yellow one, okay? Oh, well, this is the yellow one, okay? Yeah, this is a cleansing one. Great. I'm going to run and grab my IV kit. We'll put that IV in like we did the last time so you can get the medication to help you relax. Great time. Thank you. Poke. It's done for you. Oh my. No pain. You're very good. Good. I bet you've done that before. Just a time or two. Now I will put in one more eye drop. And I'm going to dilate that eye, okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll make sure to check back with you in about 10 15 minutes, making sure that eye is dilating well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do you have any I'll, questions? I'll just sit back and take a rest then. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to let Dr. Ritchie do his thing and we'll check back with you. Good morning, Doc. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good. Say, got any questions about what we're going to do? Uh, no, I remember very well from last time. Okay, which eye are we working on? Working on the right one. Perfect. I've got to put a little X to mark the spot. All right, take a good breath in and out, please. All right, everything seems to be in place. Good, two lungs, one mm -hmm. heart, one pressure. That's blood. right. Okay, so we are planning to do some astigmatism correction at the same time. Okay. Uh, just like we did before. All right? Okay. You won't notice any difference, but that's part of the Max HD process. Okay. Okay? Good enough. Be back with you in a little bit. Thank you. All righty, sir. Ready to go. You ready? Right. Go for a ride. Okay, so we take you into the operating room for the surgery. It is kind of bright in here. And we got a good view, we got nice windows. Yes, we do. Now we're gonna lay you down, and we're gonna change your position here a little bit. We'll, we are gonna move you around, okay? All right. Now, quiz time. And first name? William. Date of birth? Three. And which eye are we working on? Right eye. Good. Little IV sedation for you. I got a little sticky drape here. Now this is going to keep the eyelashes out of the way. All right, rest your head back again. There you go, just like that. So this covers you up, but we got plenty of fresh air, some oxygen coming in underneath here. Mm -hmm. So the microscope is a very bright light. Your job is to try to look right at the bottom edge of it. Now part of this procedure with our Max HD is to correct astigmatism. So I want you to look right down at the, at the light. A little bit further down, bottom edge of the light, there you go. And I put a little mark on the eye, so I know where the astigmatism is. Then we... Right there, he's um, plumping up the uh, anterior chamber will save uh, and it'll make for better access for the uh, phaco emulsification probe. In terms of um, stigmatism, he's going to be um, just changing the shape of the cornea. It has nothing to do with the lens. 
fill the eye with some jelly stuff here to keep it stable while we work. Okay. But the first thing we're going to do is make our astigmatism cuts. Open. Both eyes open and just relax. Look straight ahead. Oh. Right at the light. All right. So the first step of the surgery here is to make a little opening in the front part of the cataract. So what is that you putting in my eye? Uh, it's just water to keep the eye moist. Oh, yeah. Now we got a little numbing medicine. Okay. I put this right inside the cataract. Okay. We have broken up the lens yet? Uh, not yet. That's what we do with our little vacuum cleaner. Okay. So this is the vacuum cleaner. And I simply break the cataract. You can hear the radio waves going on, and it it causes a breakdown of the proteins. Into little pieces. And break and vacuum out each little one. How many does it break into? As many as I need. <laughs> I mean, I break them into small pieces and just take them out one at a time. Okay. So I don't have a set number, and it's not predetermined. Some people like to break it into four pieces. Now I just break it and remove a piece, break the next one and remove it. Okay. So the technique I use goes a little faster than um, what a lot of people use. Mm -hmm. So we got the big pieces out. Got it ready? Yep. Wow. And now we use, this is like putting a finer attachment on the vacuum cleaner. This is a much smaller, more controlled vacuum. And we just clean up what little pieces are left behind here. a little device to polish remember that we leave the capsule right and the capsule is going to hold the new lens right so I polish that capsule look right down at my light all right there okay yeah I polish the capsule to get it as clean as we can which will help maximize your vision now some more of this little protective jelly so we can answer it please put in the new lens so the lens goes in through an injector system so it's folded up as it goes in uh -huh. and we slowly inject it so it can unfold inside the eye and it goes right inside that capsule is it in there already yep wow now i just rotate it a little bit to center it 
and I'm gonna remove that protective jelly. We don't want that in the eye long term. So I vacuum that out. You're right, Doc, I'm way more aware. <laughs> yep. Second time through, everybody seems to be just a little bit more aware. Well, it's more interesting now. I'm not scared. Yeah, that's the other thing we hear. Now, the edges of the wound here, I just hydrate. And that seals up the, the wound. So there's no leaks. Oh. There we go. And that's it. I will say one thing, Doc. You're good. Well, appreciate that. Now, there's three rules for you today. Oh, I know. Don't rub the eye. Don't rub the eye. Take a good long nap. And I didn't do that last time until my wife, the nurse, told me to, and I'm going home right now and take a nap all day. Good. Scoot you back down, sit you up. You can actually get a view out the window. I can actually see very well. Hey, I can even read that big time fitness over there. Good. Ah. And we'll get you back to your room here. Get you a piece of toast and something to drink and you'll be good to go. Thank so you. the routine today is to take it easy. Yes, sir. Remember, it will be somewhat sore and scratchy. It will feel like there's something in there. There isn't, that's just the incision. Take some time for that to heal. All right, a nap today is a good idea. Eye drops just the way you've been using them since Sunday. Yep. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Rich. <laughs> Looks good. Who's ready to become an ophthalmologist? Sounds like this true thing. That was really cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, you know, it's, and I, there's, there's a, you know, with, with aging in America, you know, aging across the world, but, you know, you guys are going to be doctors here. This is, you know, is always, always going to be um, a, uh, a career track that's going to have lots and lots and lots and lots of patients. So ophthalmology is, is a rotation you guys should definitely consider um, when you go to med school. For sure, for sure. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah. Can the patient not be put under for this entire process? Well, um, there's, there's really, you know, we, anytime you use, you know, full anesthesia, there's always a risk. You know, people have allergic reactions to anesthesia. They can go into cardiac arrest, whatever it is. So they just give them a little Versed, you know, and I don't know if you ever had Versed. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> and it just, just kind of relaxes you. you. The other option is you can just get people Xanax or something like that ahead of the time. But they just, they don't want you to be flinching and contracting when, when they're doing it. So, you know, I, I imagine that some patients have extreme claustrophobia and um, so that they may need to be put under and that's, that's just a whole a level of you know, complexity you have to add to the process. So, a good question for sure. Now, I would cool. need to be put under. If, ever, if heaven forbid this ever needs to be done, I mean, no, I can't. <laughs> Awake. Yeah, that, that would be Julia too. Uh, there's no way that it, she, uh, people have claustrophobia. Just, you know, it's, it's real tough. Well, I'm not in anxiety that you might have. <laughs> so if you do put the patient under, is it a possibility that they'll undergo rapid eye movement? Like they fall deep enough asleep? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Usually um, when you are put under deeply, um, uh, with, with, you never... You, you get those the, the stages of normal sleep. So so people don't have REM when they're in this. Okay. Yeah. So you're not getting that. So good okay. question. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Cool. All righty. All right. What are we gonna do next? Boom. Sorry. We're gonna do glaucoma. Okay. Um. And uh, again, this is another age-related pathology of the eye. Um, it causes blindness, and it's it, this pathological increase in uh, the um, intraocular pressure causes 
your peripheral vision to die off, okay? So it causes the rod out in the periphery of the retina to die off. It's pure pressure. And uh, we're gonna go over, there's two different types. Um, they talk about the angle, the angle is because we produce um, the, the fluid in the anterior chamber, um, the aqueous humor, humor continuously, and then we continuously retrieve it. So, um, and, and the place where it is retrieved is called the angle. It goes from the back of the artist, comes around to the pupil, and then it, you know, there are proteins, there's nutrition, there's amino acids, things like that. Um, and, and then it's um, resorbed to a special little vacuum cleaner that is in the angle. So this concept of open and close angles is important because it's gonna tell you what kind of treatment you're gonna be doing. All righty, cool. All right, so um, this kind of just, oops, that's not what I wanted. This kind of um, reviews exactly what I was talking about. All right, so, all right cool. So uh, this right here, again, is the kind of blindness that the person would experience, all right? So, uh, um, the, the phobia is intact, there's center focus, but it's out in the periphery um, where the, uh, um, the, the retinal cells die off from excessive pressure, all right? So um, right down here, okay, again, this is a cross-section of eyes, so it's two-dimensional, not three-dimensional. Um, when we were talking about the, muscles okay, and how they impacted the suspense ligament that would have all to do with the um, the presbyopia that we were talking about so they contract these things relax okay and this is relaxed these things tighten and flatten out the lens okay so um so along with the ciliary um, uh, muscles it's the body that produces this aqueous humor the aqueous humor then travels like this along the edge of the iris, comes around the front, pr pr provides the uh, shape to the eye, to the aqueous humor here, uh, glucose, amino acids, things like that, okay? Um, it, it circuits, and then and this is 2D, and then it gets vacuumed up right here through this uh, canal of schlem, all right? And that's, it's a trabecular meshwork, okay? All right. Um, so what is glaucoma? Glaucoma is, an imbalance that happens, okay, between production and removal. Um, if removal gets back right here, okay, um, in, in this special uh, trabecular meshwork called the canal, then the pressure gradient increases and it goes boom, boom, it starts killing off. Okay? All right. Um, this right here is the angle. Um, hey, Doc, and so, can you, yes, uh, go ahead. It's just really blurry right now. Do you want to give it a minute to load and oh, sure, uh, sure. clear up a little? But but why? <laughs> I How's it now? It's still blurry. It's, it's your Wi-Fi. Blurry. It's your Wi-Fi. It's getting a little. It's my Wi-Fi. Well, um, do you want to try turning off your video and just do sound only? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Turn um, off your webcam, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Let me just. Let's see what happens here. We'll do sound only. All right. Oops. We're so to go back here to get sound. Okay. Um, Sydney. All right. So how's that? I got rid of the video. Just sound. Is it any better? Oh yeah, it's better now. Okay. Cool. Yeah, All right, awesome. Quicker. Yeah, if we get to the point that we have to do a video, I can always just do the video later. Okay. Um, All right. Back to where we were. Okay, cool. All right, so this here is what's referred to as the angle. Okay. So um, when there's the open angle, the angle um, is fully open, like you see right here. Okay. And um, what happens when it's closed angle, okay? And this is where uh, the, the, uh, the way the iris seats up against the lens is too tight. Then the angle will move forward like, like, like this, like that. 
And then that closes off this trabecular meshwork that we see, that we see here from being able to absorb. Okay, this happens rarely, but when it does, it's a, an extreme emergency. It's an acute problem that to deal with. Okay, the close angle. Tobin angle will slowly complain about having the vision problems that we have. Those those words, I think, I keep grabbing the wrong thing um, that we see over here on the right side. Okay. Um, so with the with the closing with the open angle where it's open like this, you can treat it um, with drugs for many years, and um, and then later on you treat it with, um, with a medical technique as well. Okay, awesome. All right, this would be a really cool uh, video to watch. But we'll watch it right now. Um, okay, so this this is a, a, again looking at this kind. Of closed versus open angle. So I was showing this over here. Okay, again, the angle uh, being you know, right in here. Okay, so then if we come over here, we look at the, the again, closed angle versus the angle. Um, what we see are two different examples. This is where uh, angle is, so the fluid is flowing, like I mentioned, across the back of the iris, okay? into the anterior tumor and then it gets resorbed right in here, okay? Again, it's a ring, so this is three-dimensional, all right? Um, with, the, with the angle closed, you see this uh, abrupt change in the, the, um, the, um, the irises att uh, attached, not attached, but um, um, kind of sitting on the lens. And this, this is likely due to some type of overproduction happening, it just pushes like this, and as a result, it's not gonna flow like we saw here. So it just pushes and pushes and pushes. And so uh, the pressure not only goes this way, but the pressure goes backwards towards the retina and it begins then to destroy um, the, the retinal surface cells. And you get the loss of peripheral vision, okay? Okay, now, um, and I, I'm gonna give one last shot at, at a video and if it doesn't work, then we're just gonna have to call it a day. But uh, alrighty, so, um, no, I'm not going to do that. I keep thinking I have an arrow. <laughs> it's all right. Okay. All righty. So, um, what happens um, when you have this increase in the, um, the pressure all along the surface in the back of the eye is that it begins to cause damage into the, uh, in the optic nerve. And you'll be able to watch the progression of damage when you guys are ophthalmologists because you'll do um, a special ophthalmoscope um, where you'll be able to look into the back of the eye for um, uh, problems in terms of the optic disc we see back here. And this is where all axons are in the eye going out to the brain. And, um, and we'll see that the optic disc is simply like this, begins to look like this. It shows this cupping compression deep to the optic nerve and what happens is you actually start to kill off the axon cycle, okay? And you see, the show this right here. Um, this is again the, the normal back of the eye, and then the pressure increases. It begins to push and push and push, and they just kind of illustrate it cartoon-like, where you have um, four axons leaving from the surface of, of the of the retina. Then it goes to three, and then it goes to two. And it just slowly kills them off. And once once they're gone, they're gone. So there's no replacing that. So, um, we can try watching this video. That there's there's a really nice flash. Um, you guys tell tell me it's a no go. All right. If it doesn't work, something tells me that some of our students would love taking this down. So we can um we can set the ship up too. <laughs> all righty. So let's let's see if this video works at all. It's maybe that time of day, Tim, where, where um, my Wi-Fi just starts to cut out. Okay, let's, okay, yeah, that's right. Before I do that, okay, all right, what I need to do is I need to change my share and increase my video. I think it's fine without it. You can just go straight for it. So does it get, does it get blurry, you think? We'll see. All right, let's, I don't let's think see it what happens. share it. Yeah, just try it like this. All right. All right. Uh, that's not the one I wanted. I gotta go back.
Ah, I see what the problem is. <laughs> I think I pasted it down. Let me go back to the other one. Hold on a sec, guys. Patience with Mr. Technology here. This one, there we go. Ah, oh, there's a uh, awesome. I think you accidentally copied the video already. I think I did. I know I have I, I know what I need to do here. You're right, Tim. All right, so we're gonna do this. Maybe just search for it. Yeah. It's 2020, the world's gone yeah, mad, yeah. and the team you manage is all over the place. Monday, How's this? Learning medicine is hard work. Osmosis makes it easy. Glaucoma is actually a group of eye diseases that are usually due to intraocular hypertension. How's the video, Maria? Blurry? No, it's clear. Yeah. Okay, cool or increased pressure in the eye, which damages the optic nerve and, if left untreated, can lead to blindness. Taking a closer look at this cross-section of the eye, you can see that it's split up into different chambers. The anterior chamber includes the area from the cornea to the iris. The posterior chamber is this really narrow space between the iris and the lens. And then this larger vitreous chamber includes the space between the lens and the back of the eye. Not to be too confusing, but both the anterior and posterior chambers are located in the anterior segment of the eye, while the vitreous chamber is part of the posterior segment of the eye. Typically, each of these chambers is filled with fluid. The chambers in the anterior section are filled with a liquid called aqueous humor, and the posterior section is filled with vitreous humor. The aqueous humor is a transparent, watery fluid that's secreted by the ciliary epithelium which, in addition to secreting aqueous humor and providing nutrients to the lens and cornea, it provides structural support and helps to keep the shape of the eye. So that fluid secreted into the posterior chamber, and then flows through a narrow space between the front of the lens and the back of the iris through the pupil to the anterior chamber. From there, the fluid flows out of the eye through the trabecular meshwork, which is a spongy tissue that acts like a drain. And this allows the fluid to go down into a circular channel called the canal of Schlem, and finally into the aqueous veins, which are part of the episcleral venous system, the veins around the sclera of the eye. In glaucoma, part of this aqueous humor drainage pathway becomes partially or completely blocked, so that fluid can't easily drain out. This causes the pressure within the fixed space of the anterior chamber to build up, causing intraocular hypertension, which is defined as pressure greater than 21 millimeters of mercury, or 2.8 kilopascals. This high pressure affects all the structures of the eye, including the optic nerve, which is the nerve that carries visual information from the eyes to the brain. And this means that over time, as the optic nerve gets damaged, glaucoma leads to vision loss. Now, there are a couple types of glaucoma. First, there's open angle glaucoma, which is actually the most common, and it has this name because the angle between the cornea and the iris is open. In this type, the drainage system slowly gets clogged over time, and so there's this gradual increase in pressure on the optic nerve. This increase in pressure initially results in atrophy of the outer rim of the nerve, resulting in a decrease in peripheral vision. As that pressure increases even more, though, there's continued damage to the optic nerve, which eventually leads to a loss in central vision as well. Another type of glaucoma is closed angle glaucoma, also known as angle closure glaucoma or narrow angle glaucoma. And this is due to the angle between the iris and the cornea being too small, meaning that the passageway for aqueous humor outflow is too narrow. And this is as a result of the lens being pushed against the iris. The result of this is that the drainage system gets blocked again, but this time causes a rapid buildup of pressure within the eye, which can cause abrupt onset of severe eye pain, eye redness, blurry vision, headaches, nausea, and visual halos.
Finally, normal tension glaucoma or low tension glaucoma happens when the pressure is normal in the eye. The cause of normal tension glaucoma is largely unknown, although it's thought that the optic nerve becomes damaged due to hypoperfusion or poor blood flow as well as potentially genetic hypersensitivity to pressures that are even in the normal range. For diagnosis of glaucoma, tonometry can be used to assess for increased intraocular pressure. Also though, visual field testing can be done, as well as looking for optic nerve damage, either through imaging or by direct observation. In particular, that pressure on the optic nerve results in a thinning of the outer rim of the nerve, which starts to give it this cup shape, and this is called cupping, and it's often seen in individuals with glaucoma. Even though glaucoma is not curable, it can be slowed with treatment. If the underlying issue is intraocular hypertension, then it can be managed by taking medications that decrease the pressure in the eye. This can be done in a couple ways. First, by decreasing the production of aqueous humor with medications like beta-adrenergic receptor antagonists and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Also, though, you can increase the outflow of aqueous humor by taking prostaglandin analogs. And Kevin, for our discussion of hypertension, people that have hypertension in their vasculature at our, our higher risk for having um, glaucoma as well. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> so you just <laughs> so you just have to be on you know any t any change in vision you have to be on top of it for sure. Okay. So you, Bianca you treat, has a question: okay. How does pressure in the eye increase due to diabetes? So how does what in the eye? Uh, pressure in the eye increase due to diabetes. So it's it's the other way around. Okay, so um, so so when you when you're a diabetic, you're much more li likely to have all problems. Um, with the diabetes, we um, the um, the elevated glucose causes advanced glycation products, which causes protein mutations in um, um, uh, trabecular network that's necessary for vacuuming out the, um, uh, the aqueous humor. So, so yeah, so they they are related for sure. And uh, and you know, interestingly enough, so um, we see all these tens from diabetes. So, um, so another association has been found that that people with Alzheimer's disease tend to have a, a much higher rate of glaucoma, and uh, and it gets because eighty percent of Alzheimer's patients have diabetes. So it's um, all these kind of interrelations. But uh, good question, Bianca, for sure. All right. So do all, all the tests, all the all the treatments. This is first exposure, and then we're going to go again um, Monday. Or finally, some medications both decrease production and increase outflow, like alpha-adrenergic agonists. In addition to medications, there are also laser treatments available. For example, trabeculoplasty is a treatment where a laser is used to open the trabecular mesh network, and this helps treat open-angle glaucoma. And there's also iridotomy, which uses a laser to punch a tiny hole in the iris, which helps to treat closed-angle glaucoma. And there are also other laser treatments, for example, ones that destroy the humor producing cells, which reduces the production of the fluid. And in serious cases, sometimes they can be used to create a new channel through which the aqueous humor can be drained out. And finally, there are implants that shunt fluid out of the anterior chamber by bypassing the trabecular meshwork and collecting system. Never done. <laughs> All right, as a quick recap, glaucoma All is right, an- cool. All right, so um, I think that's a good place to for us to stop today uh, so that um, so the participants that want to do the midterm today can, can do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop that share alrighty. And so um, so I, I, I just have a, uh, I do have a favor to ask for those of you that are not sticking around to take the midterm. Um, I mean, now's maybe the best time to leave because I. I don't, I, you know, alternatively, I can just one by one find people that are going to be going into the breakout room for the midterm, but I think it would be easier just to punt everybody in there. I am going to be talking to Lily afterwards, but um, other than that, I think we're good. It looks like I'm going to take a look at the chat. All right. All right. And Tim's been I'm, I'm answering that. All right. Very cool. All right. Awesome, Tim. All right. So any, any questions uh, real quickly on this? And then if not, we'll let, um, 
we'll let our, our next group take the midterm today. Um, and uh, if that's the case, then happy Passover to everybody from Ray Lynn. Absolutely. And um, we're going we're gonna to start, start uh, setting people up in the exam. Happy Passover. Happy Passover. I've got my mom. I'm all set. Thank you. Uh, if anyone welcome, needs Ron. extra roasted, I'll have some. <laughs> Heroes, it's the best. I don't know. <laughs> We're going to do like our own makeshift Seder and just like see what happens tonight. Uh, yeah, I'm I doing a uh, matzo brai. So, okay. Bye. I used to, um, my roommate in college wanted to be a rabbi. So I used to do the Sabbath every Sunday uh, right with him. So I learned how to do the Baruchata Adnai Chalamena. That's about where I ended. So. <laughs> yeah, that was good. That was good. That was great. Baruchata Adnai Al Hadu Mel. Yeah, it's like ingrained. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Dr. Yeah, Walsh. At some point, I kind of want to have a discussion about eyeballs with you. Is today oh, not absolutely. a good day? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know what? what? You can stick around, Kevin, and you and I can go into our own separate room. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Cool. Hi, Dr. Welsh. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Dr. Yeah. Welsh. Bye, Bye thank Laya. you. Oh, that's awesome, Tim. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Oh, so bright. There it is. There's the white balance. <laughs> later, 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 later. <laughs> Yeah, but I did really like how uh, we took that exam yesterday because yeah. I studied for it the same way I'd study for any other exam. But I who's, who's I doing the exam? Out of curiosity. Yeah, for sure, Kev. For sure. Yeah. Elena. All right. All right, Elena is doing the exam. Any and Asa. Hi, Asa. Hey, guys, awesome. Doing it. Jason. Maria, <laughs> your facial expressions were killing me throughout that oh. whole video. <laughs> It was getting to me. I don't know why. I can watch brain surgery, but I, I think it's on my limit. I, I just like, ah. Hi, uh, Caitlin. Caitlin, are you taking the exam? Yes. Perfect. Raise your hand. Hit the uh, raise your hand button oh. or the thumbs up button if you're going to be taking the exam. That way we can just move you into like a breakout. That way, John, you're moving to a breakout room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Thank you for this. I don't know how long. Wait, I'm I don't know how to like, do that. So, so, yeah. so it looks like uh, Gabe and Jessica are not. Click on the reaction. Action. And Kevin and, gives you a and Lily. Up. All right, cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a couple oh, of great comments, though. Yeah, right. but it's only if you're taking the exam. Yeah. All right, I'm going to do this right now, guys. Did you take the exam already, Jason? Are there how many of us? You just are? wanted to do a thumbs up. Uh, no, I haven't taken the exam yet. No, for some reason, yeah. I did. So oh, I'm going okay. to go ahead and do, I'm going to set these rooms up right now, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Professor. Yeah, sure. You can just move around out there. I'm gonna stop recording for now. That looks good. All right, and and then.